This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Thanks very much for joining us. Neera Tandon is a graduate of Yale Law School, a veteran of the Clinton and Obama administrations, and is president of the Center for American Progress based in Washington, D.C. Thank you for coming to Arkansas, to the Clinton School of Public Service, and it's thanks for uh, granting us these minutes. It's great to be with you. You've got quite an agenda, but so far we're into approaching the five and a half year mark mm -hmm. of the Obama administration, and yet what? Much of what the administration wanted to accomplish uh, is still dangling. Obviously, the Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, is uh, adopted and appears to be uh, pretty much in place, at least in the political form of it anyway. Why not more? We're obviously a deeply divided country with a deeply divided Congress. Yes, so I think that uh, there's numerous reasons why uh, the country has become so polarized, and that polarization is, you know, ground zero of that polarization is Washington. Uh, and I think there are a lot of structural challenges. We have, obviously have a House of Representatives that is not interested in passing uh, the agenda that the President Obama has put forward. Um, he has made significant, he has had significant accomplishments. Uh, over his, the term of his presidency, the Affordable Care Act uh, is an important accomplishment, in my view. Um, and uh, but you know, I think the country is still struggling on economic issues, and the the parties are almost farthest apart on economic issues. I think everyone recognizes that we need to do more on un unemployment and getting you know getting the economy growing and growing more strongly. But that's an area where. There's real polarization amongst the parties, but there's ideological division. You know, the House Republicans don't think the government should act to solve any of these challenges. So they don't think it's the government's role to do anything. So it really makes it difficult to come up with an answer on some of those things. And, and House Republicans would argue, that, some House yeah. Republicans yeah, would yeah, argue yeah. That, that, that they are being true to their ideology. They're being true to their voters, to the constituencies that sent them. Uh, you know, I, I actually think that that's something that's overlooked. I think that a lot of people tend to think of Washington and the debates in Washington are, you know, stupid or petty. And obviously, there's behavior amongst different members that kind of feeds that that kind of cynical view. But I think the challenge we're really experiencing. You know, I, I worked in the Clinton administration. Um, you know, and it is much more partisan now and much more. There's just deeper questions between the parties on really the role of government. You know, House Republicans, Senate Republicans worked with President Clinton to pass a big budget deal in 1997 after his election. President Obama got reelected. There was no similar um, agreement. And I don't think it's, you know, someone's just a bad actor. I think House Republicans are getting elected by very conservative folks, uh, the structure of the elections are such that the structure of the House of Representative elections are such that it's very conservative members are voting, states have, um, they've, they've been structured, their districts are structured so that um, some people argue they're a bit more gerrymandered, but it's also the primaries are much more important in the Republican side. So, you know, people are anxious, you know, House Republicans, Senate Republicans are often anxious about facing primary challenges. And, you know, I don't actually blame them. A lot of good senators have gotten knocked off in primary challenges. And, you know, politi politicians look at elections like companies look at markets, you know, and they know what they need to do to sell votes, you know, get votes, et cetera. And so it's not, you know, people complain about politicians, but it's often deeply divided voters who are, who are creating the polarization. It has not been helped, many would argue, by the flood of money that has followed, fallen, that has flooded the American political marketplace, particularly since Citizens United. Absolutely. I, I could not agree more with that. 
Well, how do you deal with it, though? I mean, does, does this seem to institutionalize the gridlock? So, or further institutionalize? It's it's absolutely uh, it's absolutely institutionalizing gridlock. It's a, it's definitely exacerbating the gridlock, and and the way it does it, really, I mean, I think it's important for people to think about this. Immigration reform is a perfect example. Immigration reform passed the Senate, very you know, pretty significant group of Republican senators voted for that. In the House, there's a lot of House Republicans who would like it to pass, but they're really concerned about primary challenges, and they're concerned about organized money coming into their elections and campaigning based on, you know, opposing them based on immigration reform. And I think the thing, you know, ultimately, if people ignored the ads, <laughs> That would help a lot. It's unfortunate that negative ads work. Work. You know, people don't have a lot of knowledge of how. Whether they're fired from the left or the right. Yeah, absolutely. It's not. It's not. It's not. A, it's. <clears throat> it's. I'm not making a partisan statement about that. I, um, it's the case that you know voters often have very limited information, see a negative ad, and it can really move the votes. And until voters repudiate the use of negative money. Uh, through advertising, you know, again, politics responds to market forces. If something doesn't work, people won't spend money on it. You know, maybe it takes an election cycle or two, but hopefully after some period of time, they'll see that it won't work. President Carter, uh, in an article not terribly long ago, I think, or, or in some venue, said that, uh, some forum said that it is as bad for the United States for the southeastern states to be virtually all red as the northeastern states to be virtually all blue. Mm -hmm. And yet, we seem to have a certain stasis anyway in, in terms of the red-blue states. Yeah, I would say that. Now, you look, Arkansas is a great example of you've had progressive governors, and you know, not progressive and like highly liberal, just practical progressive governors who've responded to challenges. Who've, you know, I mean, some of the greatest innovations in healthcare have taken place in Arkansas. Um, Kentucky, another, you know, another example of a state where you've had progressive, a progressive governor doing tremendous things on the Affordable Care Act. In the past, innovations on education like pre-K, universal pre-K have been championed in southern states, sometimes by Republican governors in southern states. So, um, you know, I, I do think, I, I don't mean to disagree. Obviously, if you look at the country, the northeast, the coasts are pretty blue. The south and the middle of the country is pretty red. Uh, and, you know, I think that's an unfortunate element of politics because it's bad for both sides. You know, I think I've, I've lived through 20 years of public service working in Washington. Don't mean to date myself, but, I, you know, it it's gets worse every year. And that's an unfortunate thing for anyone who believes that we can actually solve our problems collectively. Well, is there a way out for both sides, since it, since it either benefits or afflicts, depending on your perspective, I suppose, uh, both parties, is there a way out for both parties? You know, I actually think that there are a lot of, you definitely see it in the Senate, there are a lot of Republican senators who are tired of just not governing. You know, you, you hear it from... And they say it, they're more and more vocal about it. Uh, you know, they'll say it actually out loud that it's become less fun to be a senator. I mean, there are lots of people who are senators today who used to be governor, and they'll say it's not even a close call. What is a better job? Because the Senate doesn't do as much as it used to do. So I do think my, my view is that we'll have to have another election or two. And we'll have to see who speaks for the Republican Party. Is it Tea Party folks or more mainstream Republicans? And I think Speaker Boehner, to his credit, you know, has been trying to pass bills. And when he passes, you know, unfortunately he passes his bills, I mean, from my view, fortunately, but from, the, from one view, unfortunately, with Democratic votes. Um, so, you know, he's willing to pass bills with Democratic votes. I think there has been, you know, some bills no one expected. We had a budget deal in the not too distant past, and hopefully we'll have some more action. But I think people have to decide what they want. And you'll have a presidential election in 2016, and then you'll have a new voice for the Republican Party. Well, <clears throat> is not the center a pretty, not that there aren't some uh, Republican members who are really under siege, who are, who are 
accused of being too moderate by Mr. McConnell in Kentucky, the Senate Minority Leader. Uh, facing a really tough uh, primary mm -hmm. challenge and then a tough uh, a Democratic opponent. Uh, the winner of that primary will have to face it. But is, is, is the center not, given the current political climate nationally, isn't the center a pretty difficult place for a Democrat to be right now? You know, I actually think, in my own view, and, and at the Center for American Progress, we try to be pan-progressive, right? You know, I mean, and what I mean by that is, there are issues in which uh, we advocate for a centrist position, you know, on deficit reduction, other issues we've advocated in the past for a centrist position, and on some social issues like gay marriage, we've supported a liberal position. Um, and, you know, I think that it's important for the Democratic Party to be a voice for both centrists and progressives and liberals, et cetera. The whole, the ideological spectrum should be open in the Democratic Party because I think it's actually been a disservice to the Republican Party that there's been this effort to stamp out moderate voices. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty progressive person myself, but I think it's important for the Democratic Party to have a voice for moderates because, you know, one of the things is you want moderates in the country to feel like they have a place at the table. Now, I think what's happened in the last four years, I mean, I, I might be a little partisan in this, but I think what's happened in the last four or five years is that the Republican Party has moved farther to the right than the Democratic Party has moved to the left. I mean, if you look at studies of ideology, et cetera, uh, there are definitely, you know, liberal members of Congress, but the, on votes taken, et cetera, the right, you know, the right has shifted pretty far right. And so, you know, but my hope is that, well, you know, we've gone through a particularly difficult period and hopefully we'll come out of it. Well, and, and the and, uh, Republicans, those on the right would argue, but fine for every uh, Steve Stockman there is on the right, there's a Waxman on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but see, I think Henry Waxman is a great example, right? I would take Henry Waxman as a great example. Because, congressman from California. Yeah, Congressman from California. Well, he's retiring. Yeah. But, mm. you know, Henry Waxman in his, in, in, in his career passed the Clean Air Act with Republican votes, right? Cla passed major piece of, pieces of environmental legislation under Reagan, under Bush, with Republican votes. And I think the challenge now is that there are elements of, uh, you know, I mean, let's say both parties. I think it's more pronounced in the Republican Party, but they just right. don't want to be seen doing business with the other <laughs> side. It hurts. I mean, the, the big transformative change we have that we weren't even dealing with in the 90s, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like governing in the 90s was some kind of cakewalk. But the thing we weren't dealing with in the 90s is... Republicans didn't feel like they would lose an election if they were seen on stage with President Obama, or, you know, seen on stage with someone on the other side. You know, in, in 2002, or 2001 and 2002, Ted Kennedy passed the No Child Left Behind bill with George Bush. Democratic votes supported, now I disagreed with it, but Democratic votes supported the Bush tax cuts. Again, I didn't think it was a good policy, but it was a bipartisan effort because it Democrats didn't see it as anathema to a re-election to even be seen doing these things. So I think, you know, I think that is a challenge that if you think of your, if you were going to be punished in a primary for doing a bipartisan bill, Warren Hatch, very conservative senator, used to pass bills with Ted Kennedy. Ted you Kennedy. Know, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't, he has, he's been more worried about doing that more recently, and I think that's a big problem. So. You mean I'm sorry. So I think, you know, but again, this is really up to the voters, right? So one of the big challenges we have is primaries. Very few people vote in primaries. Oh, the most activist mem members of the voting blocks of the public actually vote in those primaries. So that's one of the big challenges we have on both sides. So the more people vote in primaries, you know, they can be a voice for moderates if they get out and vote. Well, you, met, you mentioned Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Hatch, who were uh, of different parties, but were close personal yes. friends as well, as well as sometime allies on on, mm -hmm. uh, on issues. And then you Absolutely. mentioned earlier, yeah, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the philosophical differences and the honor that's inherent in, in sticking to one's principles or mm -hmm. uh, you know adhering to honest, deeply held beliefs. 
but it's no longer in many cases philosophical or it seems, and you live in Washington so you'd have a better sense of this than us did, but it's no longer, it seems no longer philosophical, uh, no longer merely political, that personal relationships of that sort are practically gone these days, mm -hmm. across the aisle, personal friendships. Yeah, no, I think... Is there I room think, for that? I mean... The, so I think people underestimate how much these things are connected. So, you know, if you're going to the floor every day and saying the other side is kind of evil, it's hard to go out afterwards and go get a beer. You know, I mean, there's... I just think the rhetoric... Um, the rhetoric has gotten very... Tense, and I'm sure it's gotten tense on both sides, but I mean, I think that the big difference between now and say the 90s is in the 90s, people, um, conservatives would question how, you know, effectively a program would run. Uh, so they would say, you know, if we should, you know, maybe we should reform food stamps or we should reform, you know, export import bank or something like that. Now it's now, and again, this is an, this is a deeply held view. It's not like a cynical view. It's a deeply held view. But there's more debate on the most basic questions, mm -hmm. like should the government be doing this at all? So the distance between sides has just grown so much farther than it was, and it just people have to travel a farther ideological. They're at the polls. Yeah. So you know you have House Republicans. I mean you know, <clears> you know <throat> there's definitely a very liberal members of the Senate, and they have to go to the House Republicans who are now. I mean if the recently there was a um, a bill. Uh, there was a, a major bill, a major ag bill, agriculture bill. And you know, in the past, these agriculture bills would go like that. You know, I worked in the Senate when, you know, it was never a question that they were going to pass an agriculture bill. It was just what was going to be in the bill. You know, this for, this agriculture bill took a very long time. It was a big question whether they would ever pass the bill. And you know, one of the big hangups was, uh, you know, conservative House members wanted to cut forty billion dollars out of food stamps. You know, it's a lot of money out of food stamps. You know, food for low-income folks to be able to, you know, so they don't go hungry. Um, and you know, and they they have a view that the program is inefficient, ineffective, etc. Um, and you know, Senate Senate folks didn't want to cut it at all. And it used to be that people wanted to cut it by like five or ten billion. But like now, the chasm is cut it by forty or like increase it a little bit. It's just a deeper, they're just, it's a deeper issue. The transportation bill always been an easy bill, but it's, some of the issues yeah. are just much harder now. There seems to a bubble to the surface, mm -hmm. a pretty profound and, and kind of unnerving, my estimation, body of sentiment regarding Mr. Obama. These are pretty fevered times. Mm -hmm. And some would argue uh, uh, a new strain of American paranoia that was first written about, I think, in the mid 19th, 20th century has surfaced. It can't help things. No, no, no. I mean, look, again, there was definitely, you know, you can't go on Twitter or Facebook and not see some, you know, relatively heated rhetoric. Um, well, it's raw and it's coarse and it's, it's raw. Ugly, it's definitely raw and, co raw and coarse. And, uh, you know, I've gone on Fox News Sunday, and you know, people have sort of gone in, gone into the belly of the beast, um, at least from my perspective. And you know, you get a pretty inflamed rhetoric. At the same time, I would say, you know, there was a, there was extremely conservative groups who accused President Clinton of all kinds of crazy things um, in the '90s. So I think there's a strain. I think it's been exacerbated. You know, there's there's a strain in politics which is to to um, delegitimize your opponent, right? So in my view, you know, attacking President Clinton on some of the things he was attacked on or President Obama for where he was born has been an effort to delegitimize them as rightful presidents. And I think that's, you know, that's a very unfortunate thing. Again, you know, as President Clinton would call it, the politics of personal destruction. Um, you know, it's up to voters to disavow that. But, you know, I can tell you when I go on Twitter, <laughs> like there are a lot of people, when I'm on Twitter and I've appeared on a conservative show or something, you know, there's just people are, you know, they think Obama 
is not only wrong, but he has like evil intentions for the world. And it's hard to, you know, and again, it's hard to have a conversation when your spectrum is so far opposed. Yeah, and you mentioned those who can go to Fox. Well, the left, I suppose, can yeah. go to MSNBC yeah, absolutely. and hear what it wants. <clears throat> so you've got kind of this this so this public is, policy echo. This is a big this is a big challenge, I think, which is that you know I hate to say things like when I was growing up, but obviously until the last uh, decade or so, the strongest media points in the country were those that spoke in the middle, right? And but they also had an authority to speak, etc. And one of the challenges that I think has happened over the last several decades is mainstream media has been delegitimized by extremes. And people now, not only with cable, but again with social media, can can personalize their news in a way where they only hear the information they want to hear. And that's really bad for our democracy. I mean, you know, it's not good for anyone for people to not be able to hear the other side. We talked earlier about Mr. Waxman from California, mm -hmm. who's leaving the House after retiring after, what, I think about 40, yeah. close to 40 years. Yeah. Well, as the morning that uh, we're taping this conversation came the announcement that the gentleman from Michigan, mm -hmm. the longest, Mr. Dingell, the longest serving member of Congress in its, in its history, uh, is, is retiring also at the end of this term. Mm -hmm. Both men w would not shun the word liberal, probably. Uh, no, no, no. Not at all. Are we likely to see their kind again, or do we see progressivism under whatever name? Is it moving back toward the center in search of accommodate, in search of a surer footing? I think that those, that's, that's, that's an interesting, you know, I think they'll both be test cases. I imagine their people who take their seats will be as progressive, perhaps more, I mean, in Henry Waxman's case, could be even more progressive, knowing his district, which is like in the heart of Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, they may they may be more diverse. <laughs> uh, it's That's an interesting question. They may be, I don't know John Dingell's district very well. I actually think the challenge of our times um, with these, with these, um, with these really great legislators stepping down isn't an ideological one so much, at least with those two, as it is just a knowledge base. I mean, Henry Waxman has a knowledge of the Congress. He has a knowledge of different pieces of legislation. And I know often in politics, especially when we're thinking about vote uh, term limits and other things, people don't like the idea of a professional politician. But professional legislators are a real national treasure. I mean, being able to pass legislation, work with the other side, understand what the how to craft a bill so that it's really effective. That's that's a real important ability and it's not easy to get in a year or two in Congress. So, you know, I think that's what we're we're kind of losing is those people who are states, you know, so legislative statesmen, so so to speak. They've done major pieces of legislation that have transformed the country and you know, partisan politics might be bringing them down, and I hope that we get legislators who are as committed to legislating, not just doing events and being on TV, but legislating. That's one, important. One of the center's priorities in terms of advocacy, anyway, as, as uh, the year begins, and we're what, almost at the end of February, and that's the increase in minimum wage. Yeah. And it's a, it's a tough one to sell because you have many, much of the business community opposed. So actually, you know, the minimum and small business. Yeah. Of course. The, so actually, you know, the minimum wage is it, it's it's definitely an issue that business leaders, some business leaders are, are strongly opposed to. It's actually a very bipartisan issue when it goes to the public though. I mean, it has majority Republican support, very strong support amongst independents. Um, I mean, 80% of women support it. And I, I'll tell you, it's it's because it's not just an economic issue, it's a moral issue. I mean, it's not, you're talking about people who are working full time and the basic argument about the minimum wage is that you shouldn't work full time and live in poverty. And the truth is that these are folks, because they're paying minimum wage, 
being paid minimum wage, they're on government programs like food stamps, et cetera. We have a study coming out from CAP that'll demonstrate that $50 billion in food subsidies go to people who make the minimum wage. So as we raise those wages, we would actually subsidize them less. Now, there is opposition to it, but we've looked at a lot of studies. There's business opposition to it, worried about jobs, but we've looked at a lot of studies of uh, places that have raised the minimum wage, and it actually hasn't had an impact on job loss. So, you know, I think actually one of the biggest challenges in our economy right now is that we don't have enough demand. You know, one of the big issues driving economic mobility, income inequality, all these issues is the fact that since 2001, wages, median wages for the country have basically stood still. They were $668 per week in 2012. They were 607, I'm sorry, $768 in 2012, $768 in 2001. That's kind of, it's a little depressing that 12 years, there was no big increase in wages. And I think that's, that, you know, we worry why the economy is in, like hitting on all cylinders, why it's taking so long to get unemployment down. It's because people's wages are frozen and they're working harder and getting less. And so I think the minimum wage is not the only solution, but it is a solution to addressing that challenge that we're seeing. Near Tanda, President of the American Center for American Progress. Many, many thanks for making uh, yourself available. Thanks for this time. It was great to be with you. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.